So we want to take you to West Texas, where Jeff Bezos' space company Blue Origin plans to launch its new Shepard suborbital rocket and capsule. Uh, we are just watching live right now as they prepare. A CBS News space analyst, Bill Harwood, is following the latest in Merritt Island, Florida. Bill, can you hear me? I hear you loud and clear. How are you? I am good. So tell us about the significance of this launch. This is, I believe, is this the 10th one? It is the 10th test flight, and I'm going to time out for just one second. Let's watch it take off. We're All down right. to the last few Let's seconds. Let's do it. It's fast. Max Q confirmed she continues to punch her way to space. A beautiful burn on that BE3 engine. Max Q is referring to the maximum aerodynamic pressure on the spacecraft as it climbs out of the thick lower atmosphere. That's when the stresses are the highest, and it's now past that regime, smoothly accelerating as it consumes I'm telling its you, propellant that gets me loses every weight. Single time the rumble as it was clearing the tower was something to be felt down here, let me tell you. All right, we are continuing our climb to space. Our next highlight is going to be main engine cutoff, but at this point, our new Shepard payloads are inside the capsule. They're starting to feel those Gs are going to come on gradually. We're going to max at about three Gs on ascent. And then maybe counterintuitive to some, the, uh, the max Gs that the payloads are going to feel are about five just momentarily as the capsule comes in uh, that back into the atmosphere. All right, main engine cutoff is confirmed. While the speed is declining, you'll notice, of course, that the rocket and the, and the capsule are continuing its ascent to space. We're coming up shortly on separation. That is when the capsule is going to separate from the booster. There it is, separation is confirmed. At this point, if you were an astronaut on board, this is when you're gonna to start to feel that weightlessness. We're gonna let you unbuckle. I know I'd be doing my somersaults in there before taking in those spectacular views out of the world's largest windows that have ever been to space. 300,000 feet. There you see the two distinct craft in your so, screen. So, Bill, I know you've been listening, and we've got the uh, person from Blue Origin is sort of doing sort of a play-by-play. -play. Right. For us, right, we're seeing this sort of these blurry, two little blurry Those objects. So can you talk a little nice bit about what we're actually teams. looking at here? Absolutely. The lower object is the booster. Uh, the engine has shut off, and it's now falling back toward Earth. The upper object is the capsule itself, which continues upward briefly before it arcs over the top of the trajectory and starts back down again. So as the commentator was saying, inside the capsule, uh, right around now is when it's experiencing weightlessness. Uh, they get about uh, maybe five minutes of weightlessness, something like that, at the top of their trajectory. And of course, for today's flight, that's important because there are eight NASA payloads on board uh, that are designed to study various uh, effects of microgravity. Uh, so the capsule will come down on its own by parachute. The booster, which is down below, uh, is going to come down on rocket power. Uh, both are reusable. Both will land. So, yeah, let's remind um, everyone, because we have sort of competing companies, right? We have um, right. This, this company, Jeff Bezos' company, and then um, Elon Musk's company. They both have reusable rockets. What's the difference between the two, and how's the success been between the two companies? Well, it's really interesting because there are two alternative designs here. 
Uh, Virgin Galactic, Richard Branson's company, has built a very futuristic-looking space plane. Mm. And in that case, the space plane is carried up to altitude by a big jet that then drops it off at around 45,000 feet. A motor then ignites and propels the space plane uh, up to the edge of space. Again, the passengers would get about maybe five or six minutes of weightlessness, and then it returns to Earth with the landing as a glider, landing on a runway. This spacecraft is more traditional in the sense that uh, the New Shepard is a booster capsule combination where the capsule comes down under a parachute. Uh, two different philosophies. Uh, it's not clear how they're going to compete cost-wise. We don't yet know what tickets are going to cost uh, <laughs> right. or which kind of a system uh, passengers might prefer. Okay. Yeah, we noticed a little bit earlier before we were able to sort of, before we came up, they seem to be doing sort of a tour of the internals of the capsule. Um, it's, it's ready for um, human passengers. There's no people on there right now, but they've got some, you know, pretty nice seats. And we heard them bragging about, I think, the largest windows to ever go into space. Yeah, they are, no question. I mean, these are bay windows, effectively. I mean, the view at the top of that trajectory is going to be spectacular, you know, with the curve of the Earth, you know, and the, the black of space and, and the planet below. It's going to be quite a view, but, of course, passengers in Virgin Galactic's uh, winged spaceship, they're also going to have a great view. Uh, but, but truly, these windows are in a class by themselves, no question. You know, I never considered whether or not there are different types of challenges when it comes to building a window that can withstand the temperatures up there and the pressure and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely. It's a high-tech process, uh, multiple panes, and they're tested thoroughly uh, for, like you say, temperature, pressure, and, of course, the mechanical stresses, the vibrations the spacecraft uh, experiences during launch. They just said they hit a high point of 350,000 feet. That was their target. Uh, that is roughly... Uh, 66 miles, I think, somewhere in that ballpark. The boundary of space, according to at least one uh, guideline, is 62 miles or 100 kilometers. Uh, so the capsule definitely got into space as it's defined by virtually everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people are going to be watching this, and we cover these um, launches almost every time they happen. And they're going to say, all right, how much money does this cost to essentially go up and then come right back down? Because it's not like we're at the point where, you know, these capsules are orbiting or anything like that. People are going to wonder why this is so valuable at, at a time when, you know, we're, we've got a government shutdown and, and, you know, people, the money's tight. And I know this is not a government, this is a private company. But why is this sort of thing valuable? Why is this sort of development valuable, this space race, if you will be? Well. well, you know, if you look at it from a purely space tourism standpoint, obviously, and hang on a second, there's touchdown of the booster. Yep. A successful landing. So now we're That's waiting another for another major milestone for Blue Origin. And yeah, and it looks like it touched down absolutely perfectly, light as a feather. And so now we're waiting to see what happens with the capsule. That's correct. It's going to come down. It's going to deploy parachutes momentarily. Uh, but let me go back just one second while yeah. the. The space tourism industry is something that obviously would only appeal to very rich people initially. The idea is that if you launch enough of these, cost will come down eventually, uh, making it more reasonable, maybe like an ocean cruise, for example, uh, down the road. And of course, in the meantime, lots of universities, government agencies, et cetera, like to use suborbital rockets like this for microgravity research, yeah. everything from astronomy to engineering. So uh, they have a role to play both with cargo as well as with passengers. Yeah, and I'm just reading from the Orlando Sentinel. It says there are experiments on board uh, from uh, University of Florida, uh, John Hopkins University, uh, Catheridge College in, in Wisconsin, uh, Purdue right. University, a lot of different um, experiments on here. Uh, anything sort of stand out to you as kind of interesting? Well, they're all interesting to me, of course. <laughs> of course it would be. <laughs> uh, but thanks, but let me time out once again. The parachutes are out, as you can see on the capsule. Uh, very smooth looking descent so far. Pardon me as I glance away to look at my monitors here. Uh, but this is all proceeding by the book. Uh, now, they have some experiments on board to help them better able to measure fuel levels and weightlessness. If you think about it, that's not trivial. Uh, they're even studying things on this flight from the University of Central Florida to study how dust particles interact, to learn more about, you know, how planetesimals form, how small bodies behave in space on the surface of planets like the moon. So uh, some potentially big science payoffs in these experiments. And of course, they hope to be able to do these repeatedly 
with multiple flights of this rocket. It looks like the capsule, I mean, I can't believe actually how slow, at least it looks like it's descending. I'm sure it's not that slow. Well, it says there's, is that 16 miles an hour? Yeah, it's very slow. It's yeah, almost it when they touch down walking pace, but they have some small rockets at the base of the capsule that just an instant before touchdown, like the Russian Soyuz does the same thing. They fire just an instant before touchdown to slow the descent further, and it's a relatively gentle uh, touchdown. And there we go. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty pretty nice system, and it's worked perfectly every time they've flown it. Wow. Well, not the most gentle, but definitely perfect. Incredible <laughs> day. <laughs> yeah, successful That's flight. And of course, the big question is, when is Blue Origin going to launch people on board this spacecraft? Uh, they said earlier today that they plan to do that by the end of the year. Uh, but we don't yet know whether that means paying customers or mm -hmm. perhaps a test crew. And we still don't know what it's going to cost. Yeah, I will not be an early adopter. I think I'll wait till they get the kinks out. Uh, but Bill Harwood, thank, also I can't afford it. Uh, but Bill Harwood, thank you so much. Love uh, having your feedback and your guidance through these uh, launches. Appreciate it. It's, it's my pleasure. Thanks.